success of an entrepreneur. We raise the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, you Road to Growth listeners. Today, I got Jesse Krieger. He is the founder and publisher of Lifestyle Entrepreneur Press. Thank you, Jesse, for being here today. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so publisher, but also a promoter, kind of a mixed bag right there. I mean, when someone asks you, what do you do? How do you how do you describe it? How do you describe your company? Yeah, I mean, I say that I'm the, the founder and publisher of Lifestyle Entrepreneurs Press. And we are the publisher for the passionate. Um, that's my little one-liner. What does that really look like? You know, we work with entrepreneurs, business owners, um, doctors, and health and wellness experts, and then people in the self-help and spirituality space. That's our primary grouping of authors that we work with um, through the entire publishing process. Sometimes involved in the writing and advising on the writing, but mostly once the manuscript is more or less coming into place, that's where we come in and take it all the way through to a uh, edited, design, layout, published, distributed, marketed um, book. So well, that's so what we've been doing for the last eight years now. A young Jesse, was he the part of the school newspaper, had his own newspaper? Who was a young Jesse? Yeah, I mean, Relative to my love of books, like I remember my my parents reading to me at an early age. I remember at 13, my dad offered me $20 to read Think and Grow Rich. And I was like, well, in hindsight, that was a pretty cool move. Mm -hmm. So like I've read well over a thousand books at this point in my life and uh, also been an entrepreneur in some shape or form, you know, my whole adult life. So that's what led into writing my own book, Lifestyle Entrepreneur which came out now 10 years ago. It's hard to believe. Uh, but that was all about how to live your dreams, ignite your passions and run your business from anywhere in the world. So I was an author before I was a publisher and I worked with two different publishers, one in Asia and one in the US. So I went through this whole process as an author and that definitely led into other aspiring authors asking like, hey, can you help with my book or can you help with this and that? Eventually, they'd say, can you just do it for me? And I was like, what, like, write it? Like, no, no, just all the other stuff. And thus was born Done For You Publishing, our primary service that's uh, soup to nuts that handles all of the publishing side of the the book process. Well, you you were talking about that you've always been an entrepreneur. Walk us through that. So you're a young age, you're getting this knowledge, rich dad, poor dad. When did you start your first business and what did it look like? Sure. Yeah. Um, So at 21, I founded my first, co-founded my first business. Then I was all into music, played guitar, was living in Nashville. And and my bandmate and I um, created our own record label in order to, to have our own music career. So it's like I started in a creative space with music, um, being in a band, playing lead guitar and got to the point where like, okay, if we start our own label, even if, even if we're the only band that's on our label, then we actually have some input in the process compared to trying to sign a record deal, which as, as you looked more into it, or as I looked more into it, um, it's giving away a lot of creative control. Um, you know, it's speculative. You're going to get paid or how much you'll be supported. And, and, and back in those days in 2000, three, I believe when we signed it, record deals were pretty restrictive. Like you could be locked up for multiple albums and all these contingencies. So even back then I was interested enough to like, to learn the business side in order to do the creative fun side, the music side. And that first experience was highly instructive, worked my butt off 12, 14 hour days, right? Not just writing and rehearsing and recording and performing music, but now hiring and managing a team. I was 21 years old. We had people 10 years older than me working for me. It was a lot of like growing up quick to make it all work. But we released our album. Our band was named Harsh Krieger, my bandmate, Jake Harsh and me, Jesse Krieger. And we got nine songs on MTV, toured the country twice, 300 songs on radio or 
one, our, our lead song was on 300 radio stations and actually had a pretty cool, fun run uh, once, once we got it all together. So if I fast forward from there, like at some point in that, I, I just realized like, I don't see myself being in a band when I'm 40. I'm actually 40 now, which is a trip. But at 22 years old, I was like, there's no way I can see myself doing this when I'm 40. That opened up the question, like, well, what in the world else am I going to do if I don't do the only thing I ever wanted to do? It's like, um, so I'm giving you the really short version, but that led to a string of different businesses, uh, had an online SEO business, did consulting for people in the music industry, um, eventually co-founded a renewable energy credits business in the clean energy space, and, and a few others leading to a business called USB Superstore, um, which was wholesale flash drives, drop shipped from Asia, and built it from zero to half a million in sales in the first year. 18 months from founding it, sold the business, um, not for crazy money, but it showed me at that point, I realized I should write this down. Like I went from an idea to building a business from scratch, half a million in sales in the first year, and then exited, sold the business less than two years later. I just knew somewhere in there, like there was something valuable. And that's when I started writing what became Lifestyle Entrepreneur. All right, let's rewind. I know you you did the quick spark notes of it. I'm really intrigued at the original business of when the band and the record label. How much in, in when when you were doing doing that touring everything there, how much of your time was focusing on the band compared to how much time was spent spoken on the record label? Yeah, the the honest answer is I viewed it as one big continuum. Like okay. from the moment I woke up um, I'd either be interfacing with our band manager, booking agent, radio and PR promo, you know, any admin stuff that we needed to do. And then we'd have a writing session or a recording session, um, or we'd get ready for a gig, or we'd be loading up, you know, to travel to another town to perform. So in 2003, four and five, when this was all going on, I had a Blackberry. This was before the iPhone. And I just thought it was the coolest thing to like have the the early stage technology to manage it from a BlackBerry in the, in a van while we're touring around and doing all of our band stuff. So it was twelve hour days for sure. Like most days, it was just a pretty full load. Um, but I don't know if I could break it up further than saying like maybe two to four hours a day of business related stuff versus five to eight hours of music related. Um, so something like that. Okay. So, um, and then you talked about the idea that, all right, well, what am I going to do when I'm 40 years old? Right. So you had a passion project right there. I mean, it had to be a passion project. You're touring. You're basically taking on all that uh, liability, all those, those issues, everything you're doing for that passion project. Was there any sort of balancing act of going, I have to plan for the future, but also give away some of my passion? Um, at that time, no, I was a hundred percent focused on, on the band and the, the record label. And again, well, the record said, label was only there to, to help us with our music career. Well, you talked about when you transitioned into, I think the SEO business, right? Oh and yeah. Other ones, right. You gave up basically your band basically because you wanted something that was going to last you later in life. I'd say the the accurate way to say that was when we when it became clear that we were going to wind down the band, then it okay. was a pretty quick transition from like three and a half years of building that up, recording our album, touring. Like at that time, I was honestly never thinking about, hey, what's my next move? Um, it was only after that whole record release cycle, touring, and as we were getting ready to record another album, <laughs> that I was like, okay, do I really want to commit and do the another two to three years? And it was that point where that, that open appeared. And then I decided to transition out. But so the think- interesting thing was every other person I met in that time is still actively in the music industry. It was only me that changed and did a bunch of other stuff in a sense. Well, talking about that change, I mean, cause I've had, I mean, a multitude of different entrepreneurs, business owners on here. 
And some people start out with their passion, yet they figure out it's not paying the bills, not going to allow them to get where they want to get to. And they go on another trajectory. And then sometimes they look to incorporate what their passion was when they were younger into their new business, right? Because they feel like that's a little bit of who they were and they want to bring that back. Did you give that all up? Or is there some piece of you that says, you know what? I did what I needed to do at that time and I'm done with it. I'm good with it. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, the way I look at it is like I poured all of my passion into music for 10 years from like age 13 to 24, culminating in that band. I was in many bands in high school and other stuff. Mm -hmm. So I never really cared about business. I was only into music. Mm -hmm. And and the interesting thing, I guess, is that I became an entrepreneur through the lens of pouring all of my passion into music and making it work. After transitioning out of the band, I, I, I looked at it as becoming passionate about entrepreneurship and all the different ways I could use the creative sides of business to, to, to try it out with whatever it was, SEO, renewable energy credits, drop shipping, physical products, consulting. I viewed that all through the similar creative lens of like, I mean, it's not like writing a song, but it's like putting together a project to, to start any business. And I think I've always been interested with, you know, what does it take to create the structure to allow the passion to emerge and have a revenue model with it, which is ultimately what I wrote, like in my book too, which is all about starting an online business so you can travel the world or do whatever you want. Um, so using business as a means to a lifestyle end, as, as opposed to sacrificing passion in order to like just make money, which I've tried a few times, but it's never really worked as intended. So I just follow my passion into different lines of business. <laughs> when, when you were transitioning out, out of the music industry into all these other careers and other businesses, were you able to accumulate funds that you had some sort of savings that allowed you a com comfortability to try other ventures or was it more of I need to make money to survive for my next stage in life? Yeah, that's another really good question. Like the way I've always looked at that is if I need to generate money or certainly in my 20s, I would either take on a consulting project, um, something that's just going to pay a set amount for mostly me advising or supporting or working alongside somebody and using those funds to you know, start to build or invest in whatever business I was personally launching or co-founding at that time. So I've, I've always seen a balance of like, there's a hustle, there's a way to also use, you know, some creative talent and passion to generate funds. I've done that in consulting, done that in fundraising or raising money for ventures and getting a percent of funds raised. But then I would feed some or, or most of that into whatever business I was building that was, you know, where I was leading the charge or co-founding. Um, well, well, talking about that, I mean, because I think for people listening right now, I mean, I, I think you, you you say it so nonchalant. And I think there's probably a lot of people listening that go, I wish I had that mindset of the ability to say, hey, I need to to raise fund for, for this venture or I want to help some other people out with some consulting, make some money off it to allow for my next thing. I mean, where did that idea come from? Was it just over time? Did you hear from a mentor? Was it reading a book or how did, how did those things come, come about? A, a combination of all of the above. Like, you know, in the band, I, I proactively recruited mentors and advisors. And mm -hmm. so I had a brain trust of people that liked what we were doing and that I wanted to be able to tap their expertise and form like a strategic alliance sort of thing. So moving out of music, um, I had a lot of expertise in music. So the first thing was I took on a few consulting projects for like a band, uh, another couple music related companies, and then transitioned to consulting in more general or senses than just in music industry. So looked at that way, I bridged from being in a band and running a label to advising people in the music industry as a consultant to then co-founding businesses and gaining more expertise while consulting on things like business development. And eventually I, I noticed that almost all companies, 
at some point need to raise capital. And so I started learning about finance and, and, and meeting with investors and turned out I was pretty good at putting together deals. So I saw an, an opportunity where uh, I had some consulting clients and I had some investors and I took this to an investment bank and I said, look, give me a title, vice president of business development, mm -hmm. and I'll run these deals through your firm. And, and that, was, that was a real thing. That was a real story. It happened at 26 years old, no college degree. I became vice president of an investment bank. And now I could go out and talk to the next investor and say, hey, I'm the vice president of Westcap Securities, and we'd like to fund your business with our investors. I said, oh, it sounds great. So I'd sign that deal. Then I'd say, hey, investors, we've got this business that we're going to raise money for and help take public. Do you want to put funds in? So yeah, that sounds great. And then I'm getting a piece of those funds. So like, that's just a quick illustration of kind of going from music to consulting to finance. And ultimately, uh, I've been involved with all types of funding of companies and funding startups. Fast forward to today, I'm, I actively invest in startups and invest in uh, all sorts of stuff when I've got the funds available. So I'd say that's a good skill to have for someone that wants to be, you know, an entrepreneur is to understand how to raise money, how to understand enough finance on how can you capitalize your ideas to turn them into something that can eventually stand on its own feet and generate revenue and profit. So it's to this day, do you still have like, oh, I met this person over here. And then if I come across someone else like this, I can connect them or I had a book that was this. Or, yeah. I mean, is yeah. That I how mean, your mind works? It definitely is. I mean, last night I was out with an investor who invested in my publishing business and we're over dinner. We're talking about a few other things we're each looking at or invested in. Now, if I make a recommendation to him, I'm not necessarily taking a cut from that, but it just shows that I'm actively looking at investment opportunities and sharing what I'm doing and just being in that conversation with other like-minded investors, even if they're not an entrepreneur. Yeah, those are good informative conversations to have because uh, it really shines a light on like what's important to somebody that invests in startups or does you know angel funding or um, or invests into funds that then get them you know exposure to projects. And there's a whole world to discover there. But yeah, I am actively involved in that, like in parallel to, to running the publishing business. That's great right there. I guess for, for anyone, I mean, it's the idea that whoever you meet could be a partner or could be a partner for someone else. Uh, just kind of always be open-minded by it. Um, that's now, how, that's really my view. Like Vinny is I've, I've been called such an optimist that I'm always looking at where's the opportunity. Like, what can we do with the people and resources and ideas we have? If I'm interested or if I'm if something about it makes me passionate, then then I put my attention there and see if there's, you know, a deal or a partnership to be formed. And uh, and likewise, like being on podcasts and stuff, I'm always interested in forming longer term relationships with podcast hosts and people that listen to a show like this. It's another great way to to get access to deal flow and opportunities and things like that, and anyone oh. can do it, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, now I think there's a there's a difference, right, between what you can do as a person compared to, I mean, leveraging other people to work underneath you. What was that transition when you're building a business? I mean, you, yes, we're hiring people to do different tasks when you're a musician. Yet now you're a publishing company and there's probably a lot more people underneath you that you're kind of, okay, you need to do this. this. What's the difference between being, I guess, a, a manager and a, a sole entrepreneur, I guess, as an individual, I guess. Yeah, I would, I would say like my approach has always been I, I tinker and I figure stuff out myself. So I mm -hmm. get my own hands on it and then I know what I would want somebody else to do. At, at once it's a repeatable process. So like with publishing in the very early days, I pretty much did it all. Like I'd talk to the author and get an idea for the cover, hire and manage, you know, a designer, produce a good cover, hire and manage somebody to do the interior layout so that the book's already. 
<clears throat> hire and manage and oversee promotions, ads to do the book launch. And once I was like, okay, well, here's how to take a book from a, a manuscript to a finished book to a bestseller. Then I could bring in somebody to be a full-time editor and work on multiple books over a few month period, bring on somebody to do marketing and help build ad campaigns and set up promotional mail outs and all that stuff that goes into a book launch. And I'd teach them like, here's what I've done and here's what worked. But then I also empower them like, um, say like, you know, spend up to $250 tinkering with Facebook ads and then let's look at the results and refine how we can do better ads and get better conversions. So just using those few examples of like getting the competency myself or at least figuring out what needs to be done. And that's actually one of the secret keys to how to get low cost, like high quality work by giving them a scope. Like you're going to create, you know, X number of Facebook ads targeting these kind of demographics using these type of um, calls to action and this type of copy. And then we're going to track how many books are we selling or how many leads are we driving? So that's different, in my opinion, more effective than just saying, hey, I need someone to manage all my marketing. And then people start bidding out crazy high, like turnkey marketing services and all this other stuff. So there's there's obviously great marketing agencies and firms, but I've always built it step by step with more narrowly defined jobs that like if we publish 30 books a year, I've got somebody in each of those roles, editor, designer, layout, marketing, and media. And then they're just working on a number of different books over the course of the year. So same strategy or same operational tasks, but different book content, different author, different audience. And that's that's how I have approached it. Um, do you think the way books are bought or the advertising they'll need to be done to get the attention of individuals will change in the next five years or how you do business will change in the next five years? Oh, hundred um, percent. Like yes and no book publishing is like 500 year old industry. So yeah. there's always going to be printed books, but now there's blockchain, there's NFTs, there's crypto. I'm super interested in, publishing to the blockchain, like having mm. book NFTs and using crypto in different ways to help authors reach new readers and to generate new royalty streams. Um, so I think a big part of the book publishing future that I see in the next five years will be more blockchain based. Um, at least it'll be a new format alongside of paperback edition, Kindle edition, audiobook edition. Now you could have the NFT edition that unlocks bonus content. And uh, I actually co-founded a, a business, powerfan.io, where we're doing just that, um, working with authors and content creators to earn from their content, earning crypto. And uh, maybe topic for, you know, for no, no, it, it's show or something. Right, uh, because with the NFTs, they can, uh, with some of the NFTs when they're sold, you can get a, a recurring fee every time it's sold, resold. So that would be something for the uh, blockchain uh, NFT book, I guess. Would there be a recurring like? Yeah, exactly. Thing, so, yeah. Any so picture this: you could, as an author, you could sell an NFT of your book that includes bonus content, other training. The buyer could sell that after they've read the book and consumed the content. Now the buyer is making some or all of their money back selling the NFT to somebody else and the author's getting a royalty on that transaction instantly, which doesn't exist in the current state of publishing. If we sell a book, somebody buys a book, if they give it away or sell it to a friend or sell it secondhand, the author nor publisher see any data on that. And we certainly don't see any royalties on that secondary market sale. Hmm. And so NFTs allow that and it's all it's all possible now. And I think it's going to become much more mainstream soon. Uh, Jess, um, if someone's listening right now and they have a, I mean, a story they want to tell, they want to get their who they are, what they've done out there. What's the best way of them getting more information about you and uh, your company? 
Yeah, I, I invite you to check out lifestyleentrepreneurspress.com. Perhaps we can link that up. Happy to offer a free book to, to anybody here. So we can link that up too. And we'll give a link to get any one of our books for free and get, get your hands on some of the books we publish. And on the site, if you're an interested author, you can reach out and request a publishing consultation and we can explore your book idea too. Well, thank you, Jesse, uh, for, for being on the Roach Growth Podcast. I, I appreciate it. Hopefully everyone listening got some great nuggets right there. I mean, have your passion. And just because it's done one way doesn't mean it has to be done that way for the rest of, rest of your life. I mean, take your path, take your journey, and be a connector because everyone you meet could be your next partner, next friend, next connection. Bye, guys. Please subscribe, please share, and go in the show notes to find Jesse. Bye, everyone. Thank you.